Back at it again, this time understanding how to use audio files in Houdini. With this simple tutorial that I made for a client, we're going to just go through how to import web files or any audio file really, and then be able to use it so that we can manipulate geometry and make some weird art out of it, essentially. This is being done in Houdini 18, but the process that I'm using can basically be done in any version of Houdini and was originally made by uh, CG Wiki or Tokelu, so special credit to him. Uh, what I've used is simply adapted it for more of a final rendering purposes as well as a bit more adaptivity and creativity with it. So let's dive in. So we start off with just a simple line, and loads of little points together. Then we basically create a wrangle where we create what we call a P time along with a sample rate. Now the sample rate is basically what's in any audio file. You can have 20, 24, 48, 128k bit audio file samples. And basically what that means is how smooth the audio is, I believe. Anyone who's more familiar with audio files will probably know better than I do. And what we do is just essentially create a variable called P time and just using the time variable, we multiply the point number well, sorry, we get the point number and divide it by the sample rate. The sample rate is here, which can be changed at any time. And then we just create P time or per point time variable. And this essentially just manages the points over time, which is useful for audio files as it keeps changing. Now we haven't got an audio file yet because we have to create it essentially, which is in this case, we create the samples using a chop net in here. So it uses a P time attribute which we created earlier and in the zero channel in the chop network. So if we just dive in here, this is where essentially you put your audio file. I'm using WAV because it's small and easy to sort of use, I guess, but I think you can use MP3s and other audio formats depending on the codec. Again, audio people who know audio better than I do can call me out on it. Next, we essentially manipulate the line uh, to scale it accordingly, depending on what the sam those samples are. So this audio file I'm using is just a, one I found on the internet, nothing special. But I'll just show you if we increase the sample rate, for example, to say 44,000, you can see now it's a lot more smoothed out in certain areas. If we did it to 128,000, it's even more smoother, smoothed out. It depends on what, what your audio is uh, and what kind of look you're going for in the end. I'm keeping it at 20,000 because I like the static key effect, especially at the beginning, maybe something like that. You can also manipulate the scale, so in the end it goes higher or lower. This doesn't affect the audio in any way, this is just for live now. Then just give it some colour to help represent the idea of like, so the blue is essentially lower the mid ground in a sense and then green gets slightly higher orange and red is really high points in the audio whether it's extreme bass or extreme high pitch and then essentially there we just move out there then at the same time we create our our line for instancing so to speak now this scale is a bit different to the other one as in this will be scaling our geometry that we're going to copy onto this at this point it's going to be boxes, but as I explained further in the video, it, we can use other stuff, which will be a lot more interesting. Next we resample the line. Uh, this doesn't really need to be done at this point because the line has already got quite a few boxes on it. Uh, but this will again come into play later. Along with this little wrangle that I set up, which basically randomizes the rotation of all the geometry that's copied onto it by a certain amount within 360 degrees. Again, you can change how much in there. It's quite simple, just give, leave it up there in case you haven't got that on your file already. And then we simply copy our geometry. Now this is just a box, as you can see, a really tiny, simple box. Just a polygon, nothing special. And because of the attribute VOP and the resampling, we actually transfer our color over to it as well because it's still kept, as you can see, as a float. So when we copy it over, we copy pretty much everything. And that's essentially it, as you can see. Get to visualize our audio a bit better. 
and we end up with the final result that I showed at the beginning. Now to render it out as one mesh, because while this might look while this might look interesting, 6,000 primitives all overlapping each other is not good for rendering purposes. You don't want overlapping geometry essentially. What you can do, and this is where the archetype comes in, is use my method of uh, converting to a volume, or a VDB in this case, which optimizes the mesh, smooths it out a bit, and creates a single one. This may reduce quality a little bit, but so long as you change the voxel size, you can achieve the same thing. Uh, but do be careful, lower voxel sizes does mean longer processing time. So if we convert to a VDB and then this little process down here, these three, is essentially shrink it by a certain amount. So something like that. Smooth it, but that's only really with higher polygons. Uh, we don't need to worry about this for now. And then expand it again. Expanding will smooth it out as well, as you can see. So be careful of that, but I think something like that will do. And then we just convert it back to a mesh. And the mesh at the moment doesn't look very good, so we're going to subdivide it. And you can see now our final piece. But that's not very interesting, in my opinion. That's not RT, which is what the client wanted. So what we're going to do is hold down Y, get rid of that link. And we're going to just put in a box for now. Just a simple box. I'm going to scale it down a bit. Move it. Oops. Keep forgetting how small I'm in. Let's make it a polygon mesh so we now have points in the middle. Leave it at about poly count for now. You can increase it, but again, for this purpose, I'm just showing you what you can do with it. Now, if you notice, if we go into our scaling, this cube is a lot more different. It's got points in the middle on both on the top and the bottom point. And if we scale it, you can see how much more effective it gets, which is a bit more interesting and what we're looking for. So now this, at this point, we don't really want this line because it's just a flat one. So if we turn that off and turn that off as well, we can keep the color, but to be honest, it doesn't really matter at this point. I'll leave it on just because it looks nice. Now, this is where the resample comes in as well. So if we click on here, we can see all our points. Up here, there, there's a lot at the end. So if we start to increase the resample points at this point, you can see there's a lot more on there and it basically intersects the light, the two points and creates another one at the in, in between distance. And now, if we copy our geometry onto it, you can see it's a bit more interesting. Of course, this is still got quite a few holes in it because obviously the size of geometry but let's say we do something like that got a few holes in it still but a lot more interesting and what we're also going to do is turn on our randomizing y attribute and you can see now it's become a lot more cylindrical which could be good depends on what we're looking for it does it dependent on where the point is not on the geometry itself so you notice they all sort of follow the same Y orient after that, whereas without it, there are some that still stick out randomly. So, again, I'm going to leave this off for now and just keep it like that. And if we do our same process now, except this time maybe cutting into it a bit more, if we can cut a hole in, maybe no. Again, I'm not going to mess with voxel size at this point because I don't want to bore you guys with this with the slowness on my computer. And again, as you can see, this is what the smooth does. Similar process. Smoothing is really good for volumes if you do ever need to use it. I highly recommend it. It really makes good uh, use of flip, fl flip fluids and other sort of liquids. It's really good for that. And now you can see we've got another bit more interesting mesh. But it's still not enough for me, especially not for the client. So what we're gonna do is use our test geometry built into Houdini. Now, as most of you probably know, test tube geometry is the go-to for the most visual effect artists, in, or at least Houdini artists, because it's so damn useful. <laughs> now, so with this picker, we've got different levels of, of our model. At this point, I'm just going to use the medium one because it's got 
point on the bottom, as well as good interfaces, interla not overlapping, but good intersections around here and around the ear, which would be very good for our idea for the model. So again, convert it to a line, import our audio, audio and now you can see the scale is really being affected here. So I might do something, something like that maybe. So we've still got some bits going in here and then up. I think that's quite good. We'll resample it again. Just double checking the points. Now you can see there's a lot of points on here. So for now, I'm just going to stick to one. And instead of using any of these geometry, I'm going to use another piece of test geometry. This one's going to be something called a rubber toy. Same principle as a pig head, but a bit bigger. So I'm going to scale it down to something like that. Maybe a bit smaller. This one only has one set of model essentially, but it's still really good. Now something that I came across when I was doing this was if you copy your test geometry onto another test geometry, it gets very heavy very quickly. So one thing to do is to create a pack, which essentially packs the object into, instead of it being all these points here, it's now just a single point at the center which really saves on computing. So you can see 12,000 primitives down to one. And this will really speed up your copying as well. As you can see, it's, I'm not even, even then it still took a while for my piece to work and oof, something big has happened here, but I'm not sure what. It's quite hard to actually see it to be honest. I believe, you know what, I have no idea why that's, oh, I think this is because of the pack, and if I keep going, yep, yeah. it's, the geometry is there, it's just because there's so many, um, <laughs> my computer can't handle it. Um, the only thing I can actually think to do is take the point count down even lower. So first thing we're going to do is make that easy, make it even less, and potentially divide it, or sub not subdivide, I'll leave it for right now, see what that does, see if we can visualize it a bit better. No, it's still struggling. Hmm, interesting. This is okay. So for now, I'm going to just going to leave that one. I'm going to go to a torus just to save time. Make that smaller. Do it something like that, maybe. That would be quite interesting. Create our little weird do. Excuse me. <coughs> and now you can see we got something a bit more interesting still struggling with the amount of geometry and that is because of the pack. Um, I would not do this without a pack or an assemble of some kind of packing the geometry because it would definitely mess up. At the same time, packing it does also orient normal again so you'd have to be careful about how you want it to look. But if I try this now, hopefully it won't crash. Bit. It's certainly trying. Now this is where it can get quite intense. Uh, my computer isn't exactly built for Houdini anymore, it's quite old. But essentially this is a process that you need to do and if you wanted to use this a bit more, oh, I think my computer is it still working. No, it's still going. A good indicator to tell whether Houdini has crashed is the time code over here. If it stops, then your Houdini is frozen, essentially. But, like I say, this is pretty much the tutorial. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through the VDB process one more time with this. And the whole point of this is for it to look weird. It's an artist, it was a client-based project. He wanted something that can be used for art using audio files, and I believe this could do it. I do want to see if anyone makes any other unusual objects that can handle high poly counts and anything like that. I'd love to see the results of this. 
uh, being done better than mine. I'd love to just see the final results essentially and I'm not gonna lie, this is taking too long. I don't like the idea of it being over a minute just a load, especially because I'm boring you guys at this point. And it's frozen. Great. Right, I'm gonna ignore my test geometry for now. Let's try something different. Let's try a platonic solid. Platonic solid, it's just another core geometry piece. But you can change it to be something different every time. So try soccer ball, Utah, ooh, Utah teapot would be quite good. Utah teapot, if anyone doesn't know, is a teapot. It's actually what they use in Render Man for the first, um, well, for the first rendering uh, like developments. It's very useful because it's a very unusual shape but also very good. So now if I copy it on, assuming it doesn't crash again, which it might. I think this might. If you have any computer that's relatively built for modeling or animation or any kind of VFX uh, software better than mine, then it probably won't do this. It's just because, again, my computer is so very old. And to be honest, on that note, I'm probably going to end it there. I couldn't get onto rendering at this point because of this. Um, I might do another video on that along with look dev and just going through other bits of Houdini. Uh, if there's any other questions or queries that you're unsure about, feel free to contact me in any way. Um, I'm available on YouTube. I have a Vimeo account as well, similar things, and or just online in general. Like I said, thank you for listening, and I'll see you on the next video.